All right, we're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Dear Holy Father, we do pray for a blessing again upon the preaching of this word. Thank you for this church. Thank you for our salvation in eternity by grace through faith alone. And we thank you for our Holy Bible that you've not only inspired, but you have preserved. And we believe you've preserved an inspired Bible. Thank you for it. In Jesus Christ's name, help me preach. Amen. Title of this message today is King James Bible Proofs. Subtitle is The Cyrus Prophecy. Cyrus Prophecy. It says in chapter 8, verse 4, Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, What doest thou? As I showed last week, it's very important that you understand. If you have not heard the message, I pray you'll listen to it. All authority has a degree of leeway or prerogative. That just means an exclusive privilege or right. Now, it's not absolute for any earthly authority. But God has an absolute right to not be questioned rebelliously or presumptuously. He wants you to understand and reason with Him. But you have no right to judge God. You have no right to judge the Holy Word of God. He says in Job 9, Behold, He taketh away. Who can hinder Him? Who will say unto Him, What doest thou? As Solomon says, Who may say unto Him, What doest thou? This applies also to the Bible. We have no place to judge the Bible. We have no place to act like we're gods, like Eve, and decide what we want to be true or right or holy. We have no right to be like Mayor Pete, the Sodomite, who says there's simply no way that a literal understanding of Scripture can fit into the Bible that I find in my hands. He's running for president. Now, if you want to justify sodomy, because he is a sodomite, he says it's okay to murder a child in the womb up to the moment of birth. If you want to sin in such abominable ways, I guess you are going to have trouble interpreting that Bible in a literal fashion. Will you not? Because you're trying to be your own God in this sodomite, God-forsaken age. Where the word of a king is power. Question is, where is the word of the king? Where is it? Where's the word of God? I don't know what Bible Mayor Parakeet holds in his hands, but I know which one I hold in my hands. Amen? I know which Bible I believe is the word of God. And that word corrects me. It judges me. It is the lamp for my feet. I don't guide it. I don't judge it. It's the word of the king. Now, when people demand evidence that our King James Bible is the word of God, turn it back on them. For example, it's easy for an atheist, and I've seen many of them do it, go into a classroom and mock Christian doctrine and get the whole class laughing. It's a lot harder when you go up to that professor and look him in the eyes and say, so I want to hear your great, wonderful worldview about your eternal rock that just existed, your eternal soup. And one day it decided to, th to think. It, it became conscious. Or maybe there was a little alien, a Martian, bird or something that, la that laid an egg. I want to be amazed. I want to be impressed by your worldview. And I want to hear your evidence for your worldview. Suddenly everything changes. Suddenly you begin to hear stuttering. Suddenly you want to hear, uh, well, let's just, you know, work this out. Did they even arrive at their position by reason? As wise men have said, 
If they never arrived at their position to begin with by reason, you're not going to convince them out of it by reason. It's very easy to strain at a gnat in demanding evidence from the other side while swallowing a camel. You're going to tell me God inspired the King James Bible? What's your alternative? A word here, a word there, a word here, a word there, scattered all throughout the world. And you got to rely upon a false science of textual criticism, so-called science, to piece it all together. Who's in charge of that process? Are you going to be in charge of it? Do you know more Greek than our King James Bible translators at 12 years old? Do you know more Hebrew? Do you have more access The Bible says God turns the wise men backward and maketh their knowledge foolish. Ask them how they know the difference between Islam and Christianity. People say, well, what's the evidence that the King James Bible is inspired? Let me ask you a question. The difference between the Quran and the Christian Bible in general. The, the difference between uh, the Mormon religion and Christianity in general. How do you know Buddhism is not true, but Christianity is true? Give me your evidence right now, and I got my pencil, and I'm ready to hear why you believe Oh, you'd be amazing what you'd hear. Oh, well, God wants us to have blind faith. Well, we're not even supposed to have any evidence. We're supposed to have blind faith. And you're asking me, somebody that walks around, your whole basis for everything is blind faith, and you're asking me for evidence for the King James Bible being true? You don't even believe in evidence. Now, again, I'll take my pencil and you tell me what your evidence is. Come on now, that Christianity is true. And not Buddhism. And not Islam. And I'm going to tell you something. If you ever do arrive at some evidence, and I hope you do, you take those same list of things and apply them to that King James Bible, and you'll find out why it's the Word of God. People want evidence. What kind of evidence will you accept? What kind of evidence do you believe in? What kind of evidence do you have for your position? Do you have a perfect Bible? I mean one you can hold in your hand. I don't mean lying to people and holding up a Bible and saying, I believe this is the Word of God. But then you talk to them after they get out of the pulpit and they say, well, no, only the originals are inspired. I don't really believe this one. Okay, what Greek text is inspired? Do you believe it's been preserved as a Greek text? How do you know that the Greek text you have didn't come from some other language? How do you know it's been translated or copied from Greek all the way down throughout the ages? It could have been translated from another language, from Old Latin or something. How do you know? How do you know? Now what you'll find when you study anti-KJV scholars, they decry certainty. James White, all of them. I've read every one of them just about that I could find. They will say, well, we don't really need certainty. You don't need certainty? All of the Bible answers, all, all these people, these scholars, are fleeing to the Catholic Church. This was by design. If you do not have a certain Bible, a certain mother church is going to stand up and say, why don't you follow me? I'll give you certainty. People don't need certainty. That is ridiculous. What is our evidence for Christianity to begin with? Is it not prophecy? Is it not internal consistency of the Bible? Is it not a subjective witness of the Holy Spirit? Why do you believe in God? Why do you believe in the Christian religion? Apply these same things to the King James Bible. The Bible says that Jesus is the Word. Therefore, you will see a comparison between our Lord and how he was treated, and the King James Bible itself, if it's the Word of God, which I believe it is. In other words, who was rejected by the scribes? Not religion in general, not the Jewish religion in general, but Jesus Christ, the Word, was rejected by the scribes, the religious leaders. Would it not seem, and, and who received Jesus Christ? The common people. The common people. You read my book, 
the word will God keep it the 400 year history of the King James Bible only movement and I will show you 400 years of how the common people received the King James Bible is inspired but the scribes looked down upon the common people the scribes many of them said no we reject it just like in the Bible it says have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed on him but this people who knoweth not the law are cursed that's what they want to puff you with in seminary Oh, well, there's those poor common people out there. They believe that the Bible that they hold in their hands is inspired. I've met people that have gone to seminary that became witches. That said they went there and they were told we don't have a Bible. They said, well, forget it then. I leave. I'll become a witch. I go through evidences for why I believe the King James Bible is preserved, inspired, Word of God for this day and age in the international language of end times. And I show some of it by analogy. What is the most hated Bible on the face of the earth? What is the one thing that the one-worlders, the Masons, the witches, the Satanists, the Theosophists, what do they all hate? King James Bible. Who loves it? What kind of people love it? What kind of people hate it? The homosexuals, why do they hate that one so much? What is it about the King James Bible that causes everybody to hate it so much? Those are just a few things that we go through. I show that the King James Bible, unlike any other Bible on the earth, stands for certainty, reason, study. The new versions try to take you away from thinking. Why? Maybe because. They don't have the Holy Spirit, inspiration, and somebody wants you to turn your mind off. There's an amazing purity in our King James Bible. I have a booklet called Pagan Bibles, and I show the purity of the King James Bible. I go through so many words and show how they're missing from the King James Bible, but these pagan words are scattered throughout all the new versions. The Holy Spirit put a purity, a protection upon that word and guided the King James translators. Pure words, pure words, says the Bible. There is an internal consistency. See, to translate, you have to know the mind of God or you have to have God's Spirit directing it to do it perfectly. Galatians 3.16, Paul said something that could not have been known back then. He said, when you read about the promise to Abraham, notice God said seed. And even though in one sense he was speaking of many, many offspring, many children, he used the word seed singular. And Paul said that was a Holy Spirit inspired prophecy of Jesus Christ that nobody knew about. His seed meaning singular Jesus Christ. And it's something, new Bibles, they can't even read the New Testament when they go to translate. They'll go back and get rid of the word seed and put descendants with an S in there. Isn't that amazing? Now, when you start adding up hundreds of these things to show there is no consistency in the new version. You can't take word for word and study and follow the links together in the same way that you can in a King James Bible. And listen, I understand when I first got saved. I know how when I picked up the King James Bible... There was something when I read a verse that made me want to go to a new version just to see if I was missing something. I, I understand carrying around the Greek text and, and, and not being sure of what I'm reading till you find the little Strong's number or some other Greek text that you have and you pay money for the most expensive ones that you can have and, and you show people, let me show you the real Word of God. Let me show you here in this Greek. I, I understand that. But there's going to be a day, if you keep following the Holy Spirit, I believe, when you wake up and you start saying, you know what, forget all of this stuff. I want the King James Bible. Whatever it says is the Word of God, and we don't need to figure out what it says. We need to figure out what it means through the Word of God itself. God forbid if you've got to figure out what it says. Wow, people don't understand English, and you're trying to understand an ancient language. Wow. But today i got something else for you. We could, we could follow all of these lines of evidence, uh, and we've done so in the past. But I want to deal with something that relates to our verse today. Where the word of a king is, there is power. Where the word of a king is, there is power. 
As the king of kings, the Lord often uses earthly kings as instruments to do his will. So I could actually make an argument, I believe, if somebody says, well, where is the word of God today? And we're asking, where is the word that the king of kings wrote? I would say, find an earthly king somewhere. That'd be the first thing to do. Find an earthly king, because the Lord, when he goes to do something, often uses an earthly king to do it. Where the word of a king is, there's power. I'll prove that to you today. I'll prove that to you today. There is a dual authority, so to speak. There's only one absolute infallible authority. But God uses earthly things to confound the wise. He believes in authority and he uses the authority of man. Judges 7, blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And of Gideon? Remember John R. Rice loved that verse. He would put the, the sword of the Lord, that's what he called his newspaper, and of John Rice. He'd put that in there. Boy, he liked that. The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. We know the sword of the Spirit is the word of God, right? Why is it the sword of the Lord and of Gideon? Why do we say the authorized version? And sometimes we call it the King James Bible. The King James Bible. Not the King James translated it. Not the King James figured out how to take a word here from the writings of the church fathers, a word here from a Latin text, a word here from a Greek text, uh, a word here from Tyndale. No, no, it wasn't King James that did that. King James commissioned the wisest men that he could find in the world to sit down and let this thing happen. And God blessed it. I believe God perfected it. God perfected what was already there. The Bible says the Word of God tried in a furnace seven times. You will find that there have been seven, the King James Bible being the seventh English translation. The King James Bible translators believe that. Tyndale said, I haven't perfected this, but I've started this process. The King James Bible translator says, we're just perfecting what other men already started before us. Now let me remind you, Church of God, the first temple was built under the authority of Solomon, but it was authorized by God. Likewise, the second temple, after the captivity, was authorized by Cyrus the Great, the king of Persia. It was carried out under Cyrus the Great by Zerubbabel. It was later repaired right before the time of Christ by Herod. Yet the Lord Jesus, even though Herod's authority had been involved in the preparation and repair of that temple, the Lord Jesus called it his father's house. He called it his father's house. We know in the Bible that the temple can represent your human body. It can represent the local church. It can represent the whole of God's creation. But today I want you to see that the temple of God can represent the Word of God itself. Ephesians 2 says that, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord. Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone of this holy temple. Isaiah 8 says, He shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense. In other words, Isaiah calls the Lord Jesus the temple. The temple. It says when he talked about he spoke of the temple of his body. They thought he was talking about the temple that Herod had repaired. But he spoke of the temple of his body. The Lord shall be for a sanctuary and a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense. What does this mean? It means that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone of the temple. Jesus Christ is the temple, so to speak. First Peter tells us, And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense even to them which stumble at the word. So what do they trip over? They trip over Jesus. 
What did they trip over? That stone of stumbling. Listen to me. What did they trip over? They tripped over the written word. And today they're still tripping over that King James Bible. The authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now that you see that there is a sense in which that word of God is a picture of the temple. The written word of Jesus Christ. Wherever the Bible is, it would appear reasonable to find somebody that God authorized to authorize it. The King James Bible is called the AV, the authorized version. Now, I've got a lot to share with you today, so do your best to follow along. That Bible is called the authorized version, and I believe it's authorized by God. And I believe it's authorized by a king, an earthly king. We call it the King James Bible sometimes. Where the word of a king is, there's what? Power, authority. Now in the days of the New Testament, they did not have the originals of Old Testament Scripture. When Paul said in 2 Timothy 3 that Timothy from a child had the Holy Scriptures, what Scriptures did he have? He did not have the original manuscripts, yet Paul called it Scripture. It was most likely a Greek translation. And it says in 2 Timothy 3 that from a child that was known the Holy Scriptures, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Whatever Timothy had was inspired Scripture. They knew where inspired Scripture happened to be. Do you believe anything is inspired Scripture? How about the New World Translation? How about the Book of Mormon? How about the NIV? I don't know anybody that believes the NIV is inspired scripture. But all scripture. Paul said there's some that corrupt the word of God. He didn't believe everything was scripture. But there was inspired scripture that Timothy had from a child. Now I do not believe we have an inspired infallible Greek translation today. Or a Greek copy. Not perfect. But Greek is no longer the international language that it was at the time when God was preserving the Greek language. But after the days of Paul, and for many years after, the early Christian leaders believed that they possessed an inspired Greek translation of the Old Testament. So when the scholar begins to mock and laugh and just scorn and say, you believe a translation can be inspired? Take him to 2 Timothy 3.15. Say, what's this? Was this inspired? Take him to the writing of all the early church fathers. And say, so you don't believe any of these fellows? You believe they were all wrong? They all believed in an an inspired Greek translation of the Old Testament. Were they wrong? Hey, guess what they believed? They believed the king had authorized that the Hebrew scriptures be translated into Greek under a king. Under a king. Now you say, as many do, that Egypt is a picture of the world. I believe that in some scriptures and in some applications that's true, but you better go back and read your Bible. Egypt is also a place of preservation in the Bible, which I'll show you. Sixty-six souls went in to Egypt and were preserved by Egypt. Sixty-six souls. Why sixty-six? The Lord Jesus, when they were trying to persecute him and kill all the children, where was he preserved? They went down to Egypt for preservation. Irenaeus, around A.D. 180, says, Ptolemy, that's a king, king of Egypt, the son of Lagos, being anxious to adorn the library which he had founded in Alexandria with a collection of the writings of all men, made requests to the people of Jerusalem that they should have their scriptures translated into the Greek language. Translated. But he, wishing to test them individually, separated them from each other and commanded them all to write the same translation. But when they came together in the same place before Ptolemy, all of them read out the common translation in the very same words from beginning to end. So that even the Gentiles present perceived that the scriptures had been interpreted by the inspiration of God. Irenaeus, one of the earliest Christians outside the Bible. Clement of Alexandra, 
in 195, it was not alien to the inspiration of God who gave the prophecy also to produce the translation and make it, as it were, Greek prophecy. I could quote for you today Justin Martyr. I could quote Tertullian. Epiphanius says it was by the gift of the Holy Spirit that that translation was made into Greek. Augustine also says it was inspired. These scholars say, I don't believe in inspired translations. Well, you've you got a lot of Christian history here that you must believe is in error, not to mention 2 Timothy chapter 3. I guess you believe when believers get translated, a nose or, a, or, or something, there is no perfect translation. I guess your eye is going to be left behind or something. No, I believe God can translate something, don't you? I believe God's Holy Spirit still works. People say, well, that's double inspiration. How is it double inspiration? Do you believe when the King James Bible, do you believe that we have 66 books of the Bible? Should there be 67? Should there be 58? Should there be 14? Do you believe the 66 is the right number? How did they get that number right? God that gave you the books of the Bible can obviously give you the words on the page and preserve them. Do you believe God? Do you believe in deism that God wound up everything and took off? No, the same God that wrote the Bible can preserve the Bible, amen. In my book, The Word, God Will Keep It, I show Tregellis, a British scholar and textual critic. He was influenced by the Westcott Hort text. He actually pro produced a revised Greek text, but even he said, God acts according to his own wisdom in the inspiration and preservation of Scripture. As then I know nothing of God's actings except what he has revealed. He said, some have indeed thought the idea of an authoritative translation self-contradictory, but this is only one form of dogmatic a priori argument. It is said that God may inspire an original writing, but an inspired translation, an authoritative version, is supposed to involve some incongruity. But why so? Can any of us say that he has penetrated into the divine mind? Can we tell how God acted in the inspiration of Scripture? Can we say how it becomes him to act? And he goes on and on and on, and that, that's, that's pretty amazing. We may hold the highest views of inspiration, inspiration and yet admit that a version may be inspired. St. Paul rarely wrote with his own hand, and yet we do not doubt the full authority of all his epistles. We do not say uh, that Tertius and others may have erred in writing down his words. When Paul had his secretary write for him, do you believe it was preserved? Do you believe God could guide the hand of the secretary that wrote for Paul? People sure have a time of it, don't they? They sure have a time trying to figure out what God's going to do. Let me tell you something. If God was going to preserve His Word, which He said He would do, thou shalt keep them, thou shalt keep them from this generation forever, He said. Not a jot or tittle will pass from the law. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. How does God preserve? Well, Moses came down off the mountain. He had the tables of the law, and he broke them. So what did God do? He raised up uh, sexual, uh, yeah, textual critics. There's a lot of that, too, on, on the new I, NIV translation. But anyway, there's these uh, textual critics. Did they get down on their knees and try to put the thing all back together? No, no. God gave another one. God gave another one. Read Jeremiah 36. A king took a penknife, threw the word of God in the fire. Don't worry. God just brought it right back out. They crucified the Lord Jesus. Don't worry. God just resurrected him right back. God preserves through resurrection. He preserves through resurrection. God's able to do it. Amen. Y'all getting cold at all? If so, just turn it off. See, I believe God makes things quite easy. You say, well... Greek is a dead language. Nobody knows where it went. The Catholic Church just messed up the whole Bible. Don't worry. God will give it to you in the new uh, international language of end times. He's able to do it. In other words, He's able to bring it forth again through man. Through man. It's not a new Bible. It's God helping man know where the Bible is. Like the temples in the Bible, Solomon's temple. This early translation was authorized by a king. 
Ptolemy, authorized. The translation of the Bible in Greek, which God knew would be the international language of that day. He knew the Roman Empire would overtake Greece, but yet the Greek culture would envelop the whole Roman Empire. Long before I knew what a Baptist was, I never heard much of Baptist preaching. I barely knew what fundamentalism was. But I knew psychology was wrong. And as I sat there in my office one day, reading my books on apologetics, I loved apologetics, as I read the Ryrie Study Bible and the Billy Graham Foundation books on apologetics, I began to notice that it said only in the original manuscripts. We believe the Bible is perfect, infallible, inspired in the original manuscripts. I said, that's awful strange. Original manuscripts. This is a true story. I sat there and said, we don't have any original manuscripts. Who in the world are these people? They only believe the Bible is inspired in the original manuscripts? I threw the book down and rushed to my bookshelf and got another one. Same thing. Grabbed another one. In fact, every single book that I had on my shelf, apologetic, supposedly, uh, supposedly proving the Bible, all said original manuscripts. And I sat there in shock. I said, none of these people believe we have a Bible today. No wonder we're in such a mess today. I called over the, the young pastor of the church I was attending at that time and said, you've got to come over to my house. And I showed him every one of these things. And I said, you see my grandmother's Bible right there that she gave me? The King James Bible, that's obviously the Word of God. How did I know that? How did I know that? Before even knowing there was a King James Bible only movement. Because I said, you know what? Wouldn't it make sense? Everybody hates this one. Wouldn't it make sense that this is the Word of God? Was not this what God used to spread the Bible all over every single land? Isn't this what He used with the great missionary movement? Did not this Bible go throughout the world? Was not? I believe this is the Word of God. And I was willing to defend it against any scholar. Didn't know anything. Didn't know anything, but I knew that was the Bible. And I knew it was idiocy to say that we don't have a Bible today. When he came over, he was amazed and he said, somebody gave me a cassette tape from an old fella, a cantankerous old fella. We ought to sit down and listen to this because he's saying some of the same things you're saying right now. And we sat down. And old Ruckman was going to town. He was talking about these liars that hold up the Bible and say they believe the Bible is inspired when they really only believe the originals are inspired. And I'll tell you what, it was like watching a football game. It was like cheering for a football game. It, it, it was so refreshing to hear all of this confirmed that we saw by the Holy Ghost. And I've come to learn now, and I show in my book, The Word, that it was Richard Simon trained by the Jesuits, who is called the father of biblical criticism. In the early days, he was the one that came up with the originals being inspired scheme, only the originals being inspired. And he said why he did it was so you will flee to the Catholic Church. So you will flee to the Catholic Church. They do it today so they can keep selling Bibles, keep selling Bibles and have no final authority. See, that's one reason. Uh, if you go get trained to be a doctor, you're not really so much being trained to be a doctor. You're being trained to sell dope. You're being trained to sell. The pharmaceutical companies raise up uh, the legislation and the schools and support them. So when you get out of there, you're a good seller of what their product is, which is their pharma drugs. So you're gonna, whatever you learn, you're not going to learn anything about natural medicine, nutrition. You're going to learn how to sell pharma drugs. That's what you have been trained in. If you go to a doctor, they're learned to sell. Uh, they're, they're trained in pharma drugs. Now, Seminaries, what do they, what is their point? To train you to come out, lead churches, and teach your people to go buy whatever the latest new Bible is. See, you got to understand the business side of things. The love of money is the root of all evil. Well, this thing's all about authority. Who's going to be your authority? And when you don't have a Bible that's authorized anymore, when you don't have an infallible Bible, they're going to go to an infallible church that pretends to be infallible. And the Bible says, and many of our Christian forefathers believe that there would be a great movement toward the Catholic Church ending in Revelation 17 in the last days, and we see it 
now. You better get your King James Bible. And getting back to the analogy of the temple and the word, it's interesting that King James was regularly likened to Solomon throughout his reign and sometimes Cyrus. In fact, here's his funeral sermon, Great Britain Solomon, a sermon preached at the magnificent funeral of the Most High and Mighty King James the Seventh of May 1625, Dr. John William. He says, I dare presume to say you never read in your lives of two kings more fully paralleled amongst themselves. King Solomon is said to be the only son of his mother. Proverbs 4, so was King James. Solomon was an infant king, a little child. First Chronicles 22, so was King James. Solomon began his reign in the life of his predecessor. So did our late sovereign King James. Solomon was twice crowned and anointed a king. So was King James. Solomon was learned above all the princes of the east. So was King James above all princes in the universal world. Solomon was a writer in prose and verse. So in a very pure and exquisite manner was our sweet sovereign King James. Solomon was the greatest patron we ever read of to the church and churchmen. Yet no greater, let the house of Aaron now confess, than King James. Solomon beautified very much his capital city with buildings and waterworks. So did King James. Every man lived in peace under his vine and his fig tree in the days of Solomon. Also King James. But you better not miss this one thing. You better not miss the fact that that temple was a picture of the word of God being restored, being repaired, being brought. Uh, and you should not miss that as Solomon authorized the temple of God to be built, King James authorized the Holy Scriptures to be translated. In regard to this, King James stands as a second Cyrus the Great. And there are prophecies of Cyrus in the Old Testament. And it's not hard to see a double reference to King James in them. Now, what did Cyrus do? Follow me in this now. For 70 years, the Jews went to Babylon. Their temple was destroyed. All the holy artifacts, everything in the temple were taken. After that 70 years, King Cyrus of Persia authorized a return out of Babylonian captivity to rebuild the temple. Now I want you to think about this in light of Revelation 17. The Bible says that there is a whore that's coming, a city. And it says whatever city is coming is that city that reigns over the kings of the earth at the time of John. The city sits geographically on seven mountains which everybody knows has always since ancient times been the designation of Rome, the city on seven hills. So the Bible says the whore of Babylon will come back in power temporarily in the tribulation period. What it means is Rome will revive. Some believe through the common market of Europe, but there will also be a church that is going to lead in this universal Roman Empire headed by the Catholic Church. In 1960s, the Catholic Church says all religions offer salvation. Around the country, Buddhists began to meditate without conversion inside Catholic churches. You've seen Pope John II stand before voodoo worshipers and snake worshipers and says to the God of us all, What's going to happen is the Catholic Church is more and more going to merge with Gaia worship, earth worship, the feminine, Mary worship, goddess, earth worship. And right now is even joining with the UN in regard to the alarm over global warming. So, the whore of Babylon will revive. She's already reviving right now. And she's going to persecute Christians again. But she was back in power in what we call the Dark Ages, when millions of Christians died. So much so, many people believe the book of Revelation goes back to history. They're historists. Because the whore of Babylon was there. She persecuted, just like it says in Revelation 17. But it was men like William Berg and Robert Govett and Pember and others that said, no, whatever happened during history was just a picture, a shadow of what's coming in the future. It will be literally fulfilled in the coming future. 
Now, I want you to think about this for a second. In the Dark Ages, the Horror of Babylon ruled the world at large and persecuted Christians. If you had a Bible, they killed you. When Tyndale tried to translate the Bible in English, they burned him at the stake. They strangled him and burned him at the stake. And before he died and was strangled, he said, Lord, please open the king of England's eyes. And the king of England finished through the wisest men that he could find in his realm what Tyndale started. Now here's where I'm going with all of this. The Babylonian captivity destroyed the temple and all the temple artifacts. And Jeremiah said, where's the word? Where's the law of God? King Cyrus authorized, once he took over Babylon, he authorized the Jews to go back and rebuild their temple. Okay, you had a Babylonian captivity of the world. You had a Babylonian captivity in the world. Then you had a Reformation. And then there's King James that puts the Bible in English, authorized it. And that Bible, and no other Bible like it, spread to all the lands of the world, bringing Christianity. Now I want you to look at this prophecy of Cyrus. This prophecy was written about a hundred years before Cyrus ever came to power. It says in Ezra 1, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, I'm sorry, the prophecy will be here in Isaiah that we'll get to in a minute. Ezra says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing. See, God knew that the English kingdom would be the kingdom that would spread around the world. And America was just an offshoot of England. And King James made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom in the same way. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him. And let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods. Also Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth out of Jerusalem, and had put them in the house of his God. This was a fulfillment of what God had said through Jeremiah and through Isaiah. Now let's go back before there ever was a Cyrus, before Cyrus was ever born. And let's look at Isaiah 44. One shall say, I am the Lord's. And another shall call himself by the name of Jacob. And another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord and surname himself by the name of Israel. Now you hold that verse in your mind. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself, that confirmeth the word of his servant, and performeth the counsel of his messengers, that saith to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be inhabited, to the cities of Judah you shall be built." and I will raise up the decayed places thereof. That saith to Cyrus, God names him, a hundred years before he was ever born, he is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built into the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. Here you have a prophecy, that a king would be born. His name would be Cyrus. God said, I have named you before. I have named you before. And you're going to come and you're going to let my people go back and rebuild their temple. And linked to the same prophecy are these words, and others shall call himself by the name of Jacob. Do you know James in English is Jacob? I'm sorry, a Jacob in English is James? 
Do you know it's from the same Latin word? James and Jacob mean the same thing? You have a man now called King James. As Christians are awakening and coming to the mainstream out of Babylonian captivity, the decayed places are built up and the Word of God is restored in the mainstream. The mainstream. Wherever it was before, whatever cave, whatever mountains Christians are hiding, it's restored in the mainstream now in the King James Bible. 66 souls went into Egypt to be preserved with Jacob. James means Jacob. I do believe that we have a prophecy here that there's going to be a Cyrus. A Cyrus. He's going to be called Jacob. He's going to be called James. And he was going to bring forth the rebuilding of the Bible. The regathering, if you will, into the international language of the end times. Let's keep reading. He goes on in chapter 45, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him. And I will lose the loins of kings to open before him the two levered gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by name, am the God of Israel. I believe the King James Bible is full of the treasures of darkness and the hid hidden riches of secret places. If you want to find the truth, it's going to be in the King James Bible. If you want the real nuggets, it's going to be in that King James Bible. I tell you what, if you go to that Bible in faith, the Bible says the Word of God did not profit them because they didn't have faith. You go to that Word and says, God, I believe this is the Word of God. I trust that I don't need to correct it. I don't need to find somebody. I, I need to read this Bible as the Word of God. You will not believe what it will do to your Christian life. You will not believe what it will do to you in your Christian life. And God will confirm it for you. God will confirm it. The Lord which call thee by thy name, and the God of Israel. For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel my elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. And I believe God's surname won Jacob. I believe God's surname won Jacob. King James. That they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west, that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. That's where that King James Bible went. That's where the King James Bible went. From the rising of the sun and from the west. I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city, and he shall let my captives. Let him go, not for price nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. Thus saith the Lord, the labor of Egypt and merchandise of Ethiopia and of the Sabians, men of stature, shall come unto thee. They shall be thine. They shall come after thee, and chains shall they come over, and they shall fall down unto thee. They shall make supplication unto thee, saying, Surely God is in thee, and there is none else. There is no God. I'm going to tell you what, there's no Bible like our King James Bible. And, and, and I'm telling you, around the world, there are people that know that book is the Word of God. And people can't stand it. They cannot stand it. They cannot stand it. The destruction of the temple was still a hundred years in the future, but God's already telling you what king is going to lead the revival, what king is going to lead the restoration and rebuilding. Now, Cyrus was not like the king of Babylon, the later kings of Babylon. He was against an effeminate lifestyle. He took care of himself. He wasn't a partier, so to speak. King James was against being effeminate. He wrote against tobacco and things like that. Now, I want you to look at the image in Daniel chapter 2. I'm not going to bring it before you. If I had a big chalkboard or something, I would try, but you probably couldn't read my handwriting anyway. Um, I want you to understand, remember that in Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar sees a dream and it's of a big image. Do you remember that? Now I want you to remember when he sees this image, he calls for the wise men, the magicians, to interpret his dream for him. But he says, first you must tell me what the dream is. And nobody could do it. So he got frustrated and was going to kill every single wise man. But Daniel said, I will. Tell the king, I will give him his dream. So Daniel comes and says, O king, what you saw was this big image and the head. And then you saw the arms and the breast. You saw the thighs. You saw the legs and the feet. And then you saw a stone come out of nowhere and smite the image on the feet and destroy it. 
He says, now let me interpret this for you. You are the head. And after you will come the kingdom of Media Persia. And after that will come the kingdom of Greece. And after that will come the fourth kingdom. Dreadful. Deadly. That is pictured by the legs. And then it has another form of the ten toes. The feet and the ten toes. And then this stone's going to come, which we know to be the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. As you read Daniel chapter 2, and Daniel chapter 7, and Daniel chapter 8, you will find that God, hundreds of years before, predicted that the kingdom of Babylon would be followed by the kingdom of Persia. And the kingdom of Persia would be followed by the kingdom of Greece. And the kingdom of Greece would be followed by what we know in the New Testament as the kingdom of Rome. And everybody was looking for the Messiah's kingdom because it's supposed to come in the days of Rome. And who does show up? Jesus the King. And he says the kingdom of God is here. But they were waiting for him to take over the Roman Empire. He says, I have to do some other, you got to read the Old Testament. I have to do some other things first. I must suffer and die. They didn't like that. They wanted to hear, wait a minute, we want you to take over the Roman government. Even John the Baptist was confused. Now, why was Nebuchadnezzar the head and not the feet? That's a big question, isn't it? Why, if we're going through history, did you not begin with the feet and go through time so you end over here with the head? Why, why, why does it do this? It appears to be laying sideways as if we're looking at time left to right. So you have the head, and then you have the chest, and then you have... a. Uh, all the way down the waist and the leg, the thighs and the legs and the feet. So as this thing goes through history, it's like an image laying sideways. And I believe that image is casting, it is a shadow of things to come. So you have to look like an L shape, a backwards L. And you have Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, the kingdom of Christ. And then we go up this way. So you will go up to where you have the head and what do you see in the book of Revelation? Mystery Babylon. Not Babylon. Mystery Babylon. So in the book of Revelation, Revelation 17, if you had the image laying sideways to your left here as a shadow of the upright image, the head would be on top, would be Babylon. And sure enough, the furthest point would be the head, which was Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon. Now, as you move forward in time, you will come to the kingdom of Persia. That means under the head, you should have a mystery Persia. And as you move forward, you would have Greece. So under that, you should have a mystery Greece. And as you move forward, you would have Rome. Under that, you should have mystery Rome. And you would have finally the kingdom of Christ, and right here, you should have the mystery kingdom of Christ. So my point is this. Why would we not expect that if the tribulation period to come is going to have mystery Babylon, that means before the tribulation period comes, you need to have an age of mystery Persia where there will be a revival of light out of captivity. Then you would have a mystery Greece. Then you would have a mystery Rome, which would be around the second and third century. If we were just simply to take this whole New Testament age period, this whole 2,000 year period, and we were to draw the tribulation period and come back and draw a section that said mystery, but mystery Persia, and then we come back and draw mystery Greece, and then draw mystery Rome, and then draw the mystery kingdom of Christ, what you would have is around the 2nd and 3rd century is where mystery Rome would be. The Bible says when Rome comes, it's going to have 10 horns, it's going to have 10 toes, and it's going to stomp and smash and be dreadful in its persecution. Do you know when the worst persecutions in all of history happen to be? Under the Roman government? It was in the 2nd and 3rd century, and they say there were 10 Roman edicts, as well as 10 days, I'm sorry, 10 years of persecution that was the worst of all.
Premillennial interpreters generally believe that in history, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome was followed by Christ's kingdom, either in a spiritual sense or a sample portion. They believe that the clock stopped, so to speak, so that the Roman kingdom, which was seen in its two legs, was finally frozen, awaiting time to start back again at the revival of the nation of Israel, where it will finally end up in its ten toes with the whore of Babylon under Antichrist, persecuting Christians like never before with the ten kings. And then the Bible says Christ comes out of the sky and those who are faithful come with him to judge those ten kings of Antichrist. If we begin with a mystery form of Christ's kingdom, when Christ the king was present, the next age would be a mystery Roman kingdom in the second and third centuries. And it will continue up until you have a kingdom of Persia with some type of revival under a king, and then finally the tribulation period with mystery Babylon. If none of this makes sense to you, I hope one thing makes sense to you. That just as the Jews came out of Babylon, so many Christians awakened out of the Catholic Church and got out from under its bondage where they didn't have to hide in caves and mountains. And it was a king that helped bring that forth by spreading the King James Bible throughout all the lands of the world to break the bondage that the Catholic Church had brought to the world. If you don't follow everything that I just said about that image, I hope you can get this one thing straight, that God used the king, the king of Cyrus, uh, the king of Persia, Cyrus, to rebuild that temple. And I hope you can see that if you're looking for the word of God in these last days that's been preserved, find the word of a king. Find the word of a king. Let's go through it another way. You can look at the past 2,000 years by looking at the pattern of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And sure enough, we get the same teaching. I believe these were seven literal, local, historic churches. And I also believe that they are a pattern of what God will be doing and what His people will be doing throughout 2,000 years of history, 2,000 years or so of history. The first church is Ephesus meaning desirable one. It had apostles. The second church is Smyrna. It means myrrh. Myrrh is associated with suffering. you got to crush it for it to smell good. The third church is Pergamos, which means marriage. When they say the many married the world through the Catholic Church. Then you have Thyatira, which means a sacrifice. Some believe because of the sacrifice of the Mass. Others believe because so many Christians were sacrificed under Rome. Then you have Sardis. Sardis means the remnant, those who escape. Many take this to be the Reformation period, the early Reformation period. Then you have Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love, finally concluding in Laodicea that takes you out into the tribulation period, which means rights of the people. So I hope you can see 2,000 years of history right here. Laodicea, the rights of the people where everybody says, I want my way, I want my way, I want to do it my way. I don't care what God says about dress. I don't care what God says about morality. I don't care what God says about marriage. I don't care what God says about drunkenness. I want to do it my way. Laodicea. I believe that definitely describes many churches in this day and age, as well as the spirit of this age. And the Bible says Laodicea, as we'll read in a second, doesn't realize how naked it is. Now let's go back. Revelation 2. Unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? That's the pastor of the church in Smyrna. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried. And you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. 
He's not telling you you lose salvation in eternity. And he's not telling you you're saved by works. But he is telling you that you will escape some great punishment at the judgment seat of Christ if you will be faithful unto death for the Lord Jesus and you will reign with him in the coming millennial kingdom. I believe there literally were 10 days of tribulation for that literal church. However, when we look at the picture, this becomes the second church age. And that will put us out of the days of the apostles into the days of the worst Roman persecutions. As I said, that mystery Roman kingdom uh, that the shadow portrays, uh, portrayed by the shadow. So what we have here are the ten Roman edicts, I believe, or you could look at it as the ten years of the worst persecution, I believe, under Diocletian. But then look at Revelation 3, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David. Why does he say that? He that openeth and no man shutteth. Why does he say that? And shutteth and no man openeth because something's going to be opened up to this church. When I say this church, I mean this age. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. Wow. And no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my what? My word and hast not denied my name. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So if you were to take the last 2,000 years and just somewhere, just start dividing them into seven ages, somewhere around our age, you will see the church of Laodicea, rights of the people, a naked church, a proud church that likes to sing songs about itself, that says, I'm not, I'm not insane. I, I mean, I'm not walking in any abominations. That is that wicked church that goes right out into the tribulation period, and we see much of it right now. Well, if you go back from that, you will see an age which God says is the Philadelphian age. And I believe it is an age which has an open door. It's an age that has the word of God. It is an age that has kept the word of his patience. And it will not be an age that goes through the tribulation period. And you know what? You want to be identifying with the spirit of that age right now. You want to come out of Laodicea and you want to find out where the churches are that are identifying with that age and look to be translated like Enoch, amen, and look to be taken out of this world so we suffer not the hour of temptation which is going to come upon all the world. But let's look at this wicked Laodicea. Revelation 3, 14, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would that thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Wow. I hope you can see Laodicea all around you today. And I hope you can see that if you're looking for the Bible, let's go back and see this Philadelphian church age. What happened? As I show in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of quotes from 1611 all the way up, if you want to see what God did with the King James Bible, it is amazing. It is amazing. This country was built upon the King James Bible. The Christian religion and, and the truth spread. The gospel spread. Baptist churches flourished. They call it the Baptist Bible because it just flourished around the world what that King James Bible did. And God says they have kept the word of my patience. As I close today, in the news, ironically, I would have preached this same sermon exactly like that, even if these news reports were not in the news, but it's very interesting what's happening out here today. If you go back to 1811... Talking about the Jews, it says their hopes of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem the third and last time under the auspices of the Messiah or of a second Cyrus before his coming are always expressed with great confidence. They have a general impression that the period of their liberation from the heathen is not very remote. So the Jews have been looking for their regathering, their rebirth of their nation. And right now they're looking for the rebuilding of their temple. So some amazing things are happening right now. They said it could be the Messiah who builds it 
or it could be a type of Cyrus who rebuilds it. But the book of Revelation says this temple will be rebuilt. And Moses and Elijah will start preaching very soon. And they'll preach that you children are to turn your hearts to your fathers. That's what, that's what Moses is going to start preaching. That's what Elijah is going to start preaching. Now, in regard to this second Cyrus, you could go to ChristianHistoryInstitute.org. Paul Char Charles Merkley says, Harry Truman's support for the creation of the state of Israel was rooted in his interpretation of Scripture. By the way, Harry Truman believed the King James Bible was the Word of God. Very interesting. Very, I'm not endorsing everything that Truman has ever done, but he did believe that the King James Bible was the Word of God, or professed to. Harry Truman's support for the creation of the state of Israel was rooted in his interpretation of Scripture. In November 1953, just a few months after leaving the presidency of the United States, Harry Truman was brought to the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. Jacobson introduced his friend to the assembled theologians. This is the man who helped create the state of Israel. But Truman retorted, What do you mean help to create? I am Cyrus. I am Cyrus. They certainly thought that he was a type of Cyrus. For his friendship. Here you see the American government helping the Jews. The American government came out of Britain. And you see this support for Israel and for the King James Bible coming out of Britain. Whatever you think of Jews, whatever you think of Zionism, facts are facts. And the Bible said Israel would be reborn in unbelief. In unbelief. And that's exactly what has happened. But the Bible said the time is coming when the Spirit will blow upon those bones. Now recently, Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, listen to what he says. Thank you, Mr. President, talking about Trump. This is the first time we meet in Washington, America's capital, capital, after you declared, Mr. President, Jerusalem as Israel's capital. So Trump declared his administration, Jerusalem, to be the capital of Israel. It was recognized as the capital. And this was a historic proclamation followed by your bold decision to move the embassy by our upcoming National Independence Day. I want to tell you that the Jewish people have a long memory. So we remember the proclamation of the great king Cyrus the Great, the Persian king. 2,500 years ago, he proclaimed that the Jewish exiles in Babylon can come back and rebuild our temple in Jerusalem. We remember 100 years ago, Lord Balfour of Britain, who issued the Balfour Proclamation that recognized the rights of the Jewish people in our ancestral homeland leading up to Trump, uh, leading up to Truman in 1948. Many of the Jews today now are calling President Trump the second Cyrus. The Guardian said in 2017, does the Cyrus prophecy help explain evangelical support for Donald Trump? He might not have been one of God's people, the thinking among some Christian goes, but he still served God's plans. In an official White House statement on Wednesday, Trump quoted King Cyrus on the occasion of the Persian New Year. The earliest and most visible public proponent of the Cyrus connection was Lance Walnow, a business consultant who has a doctorate in ministry. In 2016, before he met candidate Trump, the Lord spoke, quote, to Walnow, telling him, Donald Trump is a wrecking ball to the spirit of political correctness. Before his second meeting with Trump a few months later, Wall now saw an image of him as the 45th president and once again heard God speaking, read Isaiah 45. Thus saith the Lord, the chapter begins, to his anointed, to Cyrus. Other prominent evangelists, including Kurt Landry, Derek W. H. Thomas, have spread the word about the Cyrus prophecy. Some ultra-Orthodox Jews have also embraced the Cyrus prophecy. For them, Trump is a Cyrus who will help Israel to settle properly in its land. Trump's support for Israel and the president's commitment to moving the U.S. embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem confirm the prophecy. Christianity Today says Cyrus prophecy, the reason why witches everywhere are casting spells on Donald Trump. Jerusalem Post, just the other day, says top Israeli rabbis laud Trump and his settlement policy decision. Leading religious Zionist rabbis in the world penned a letter lauding the American president. Among the signatories were four of the most revered and respected rabbis in the religious Zionist community, along with more than 200 other rabbis from the sector. It was the Trump administration's decision to reverse the previous U.S. position that settlements were illegal and prompted the rabbis' outpouring of thanksgiving, which was replete with biblical and even messianic references. 
The rabbis began their missive by quoting the prophecies of Jeremiah about the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel, and specifically Judea and Samaria, otherwise known as the West Bank. Two years ago, we merited recognition granted by you and by the United States of America of the centrality of Jerusalem. And now we have merited recognition of the legality of Jewish settlement in Judea and Samaria, the rabbis wrote. Washington Post, just the other day, the Trump administration's obsession with an ancient Persian emperor. In fact, Cyrus Day was celebrated a few weeks ago. Now listen to me as I close. The Bible predicted the regathering of Israel and a rebuilding of the temple. Nobody knows who is going to rebuild or authorize the rebuilding of that temple. It could be President Trump. It could be the Antichrist. But the temple will be rebuilt. And the fact that Jerusalem is being recognized, protected by the American power, shows us that we're getting very, very close to that temple being rebuilt. Now, before that temple is rebuilt, there's going to be a catching away of some Christians. And we're to watch and pray always that we may be accounted to escape all these things that are coming. The closer we get to that temple the closer we get to God calling some people out of here. And there's going to be some left behind. There's going to be some that aren't watching and praying. There's going to be some whose garments are not ready. There's going to be some that are eating and drinking with the drunken. And there's going to be some that are just lukewarm. You're neither hot nor cold. If you walk out to the peach tree in the spring and you see some ripe peaches that are early ripe and you pluck them off, that's what the Lord's going to do to some Christians. But if you see a bunch of green peaches or ones that are hard and not yet red, they got to stay behind in the sun. Some believers are going to stay behind in the hot sun, the tribulation sun. I don't want to be a part of that number. I want God to have mercy upon me and account me worthy to escape. Let's try to be ready. Let's try to repent of our sin and get ready. If you're not saved, if you're not a believer in Christ and you're listening to this sermon, I pray you'll believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray you will believe that the King James Bible is the word of God and that you will understand that it tells you that you cannot save yourself by your own works. You must trust in the blood of Jesus Christ who lived a perfect life for you and died on the cross for your sin. Not of works lest any man would boast. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth upon him, that's what he wants you to do, believe you're a sinner and believe that he paid the price for your sin. Whosoever believeth upon him should not perish but have everlasting life a salvation you can never lose, a salvation you never deserved and you cannot earn through faith. But God also has a prize for you after you're saved. And he wants you to enter his thousand-year kingdom. He wants you to labor for that crown, to suffer with him. I do not know what the future holds in regard to President Trump. I do not know what future he will play in the rebuilding of this temple. But I do know this. There will come a man that's going to please the nation of Israel. And they're going, to also, they're going to practically worship the man. Some will think he is the Messiah. Some will think he is the coming of their Messiah. And the Bible says he will confirm the Jewish covenant for one week, for seven years. And in the midst of that time period, he will break that covenant. And there will be the worst persecution that's ever been on the face of the earth. Dear Lord, bless the people. Bless their understanding of these things. Thank you for the King James Bible, the authorized version. Where the word of a king is, there's power. In Jesus' name, amen.